have any questions uh, throughout the thing. But anyway, back in uh, at the end of 2019, Corona sort of escaped Wuhan, and by early uh, 2020, we started to become affected by that as well. By late spring 2020, it became clear that we probably have to uh, teach online asynchronously or synchronously, whichever one. And initially, I was very cool with that. I already had slides for all my lectures, and so I thought I would just do a voiceover over the slides, and that won't take too much work. I'm sort of a procrastinator and a minimalist, and so I thought that would be very easy, okay? But then uh, later um, in the summer, I attended a technical conference, and most of the talks were sort of uh, people just showing slides, like the one presented here on the left, and you don't, you know, this is all computer geek stuff, so you don't have to understand what the content is, but it's effectively just a slide. And then somewhere on the slide, they had a small corner with a face or a head on it that would do the talking. And um, it struck me how awful that really was. And then one uh, researcher at that conference gave a different style of talk, and it was sort of like this. You saw the person's, the, he had the slide on the left, and on the right, you saw the person standing, and you could see his hands move around, he would move around, you could see sort of the body language, et cetera. It was totally in a different league. So much better, so much more effective. Even though he didn't interact with the slides directly, it was still great. And after seeing that talk, I sort of uh, decided then and there that I would do my lecture sort of very similar to that. And in fact, I thought I would up the game a little bit and try to interact with the slides as I was going over it by pointing to individual items on the slides and things of that sort. So then I started thinking, well, how do you do that? And the first option that I came up with was, well, I just take a large empty wall. I go out and buy a very big screen TV, a six foot by four foot TV where I could project the slides. I would stand in front of it, have a video camera, and then just give my lectures that way. But I gave up on this uh, pretty quickly because uh, where I live, there's no large empty wall, and uh, the TVs that are good quality of the size that I needed were uh, simply far too expensive. So I gave up on uh, this option, and I started to uh, investigate uh, a little bit more, did more research, and started thinking a little bit you know, how do newscasters do it? How do the weather people on TV do it? How does uh, uh, John Oliver do it on TV? And I did the research and I found out that they really uh, use software to layer different video components onto each other. So on at the back end of those layers, they would have a background screen, and that could also be a video with uh, movements, but in, in my case, it's just a blue screen like this. Then they have a second layer, which they superimpose on that in software in real time, where they show the slides. And then as the third layer on top of all that, they would superimpose a video of the person speaking. And this was sort of the effect that I wanted to do. Getting the software to superimpose these layers was very, very straightforward. The challenge is how could I get a video of myself with no background so that I can superimpose it on top of the slide and the background? And it turns out the way you have to do that is you need a gigantic green screen and you have to video record yourself in front of that green screen and then you need some uh, chroma keying software that takes out the green and creates a video where just you are in it with no background at all and so then you layer yourself on top of the slide on top of the background and that gives you uh basically the effect that i wanted to have okay and now, if you can uh, steal the screen from me and show the first video, this shows sort of what the product uh, looks like after I produced all of it. Just as an example, it's tech speak. You don't have to understand it, but uh, go ahead.
Hello everyone. In today's lecture, we're going to dig down one level deeper into the uh, design of file systems. The whole purpose of a file system is to store files and directories in a persistent way, in a durable way. Okay? It provides operations so applications can read the files, write the files, find out information about these files. Okay? So, when we store a file, we not only have to store the blocks that belong to a file, but also the information related to where they are stored okay? and in what order they exist. Okay? So when we say that we want to store files durably, we mean not only is the data blocks belonging to the file stored durably, but also all information related to them as to which blocks belong to which file, which blocks belong to which directories, things of that sort is also stored durably on the disk. Okay? And the reason is because we had weird interleaving. The operating system decided, the scheduler decided to do a context switch here. Okay? And we can come up with other examples and other interleavings. Sometimes it's fine and sometimes it won't and you'll get incorrect results. Okay. Let me try to uh, give you a live uh, demonstration to show this in practice. Okay. Uh, give me one second as I switch over here to my terminal and I hope you can sort of read it. We have here, we're going to create two threads. The two threads get created right here. Okay. And the threads will be running the worker function. The worker function here, we simply see from one. And so let's try to uh, run this. So if I run uh, threads, and let me give it the argument of let's say 10,000. So we want the both threads to increment this by 10,000. And I run this and it gets set to some number. And if I run this again, it's a different number. And if I run it again, it's a different, oh, this time it worked perfectly. Okay, can you put me back? You might have to reshare your slides. Okay, okay let me try yeah. to. Uh, complicated stuff here. Let me see. Okay. So this is the fundamental setup that I used to create that. And um, on the left, you see I have a gigantic uh, green screen. I stand in front of it. On the right, you see a camera. The camera outputs HDMI signals. Unfortunately, most computers don't accept HDMI signals as input, so you need an HDMI capturing device. And that translates it into a USB type of signal that is input into the computer. And below the computer, you see also you need some studio lighting so you don't look too awful. Now, the whole trick in giving a lecture like this is because you only have the green screen behind you. You don't actually see anything. You don't see the slides on the green screen. So the software that composes everything together, takes the three layers and puts them together. You use that to output to a monitor that is in front of you. And so when you point at something like in the slide, you only see it in the monitor and you have to sort of get used to a little bit the coordination of your hands movement and finger pointing so that it actually uh, points to the right thing, okay? So to create these uh, videos, I basically uh, converted my uh, living room into a video recording studio. And I have to admit, I had to invest quite a bit of money to be able to make uh, do it. So I had to go out and buy a green screen, cost about $100. I had to get real studio lighting, about $500. Uh, the camera was $600. I first bought a cheap one for $300, and then it turned out that it didn't have an audio input. 
And then it was very difficult to sync up the audio with the video, so I had to go out and buy a more expensive uh, camera. Uh, the video capturing devices is not cheap at $500, the wireless microphone about $300. It turns out the laptop I had wasn't powerful enough to uh, be able to process video in HD quality. So I had to go out and buy a more expensive laptop that had the power that was needed and I needed a monitor. So overall, it cost me uh, an investment of about $5,000, okay? And if we can, um, this is a recording. The next video is a recording of what this studio actually looks like. So if you don't mind sharing that. And then there's money from um, they let you for JJ. Okay, very good. So, to put everything together, this is the software I needed. And luckily, all the software is actually amazing what it can do, and it's all free. So, I use OBS to do the layering, to do the coma, creeing, uh, coma keying, 